Like many great business ideas, it starts with a problem. Access to airport lounges used to be limited to business or premium travelers only. For Malacca bond Song Hoi Si, that didn't seem right. So he started Plaza Premium Lounge in 1998, where all travelers, regardless of their airline or class of travel, can use for a fee. Plaza Premium now has the largest independent airport lounge network in the world, operating in 45 airports across 22 countries. Uh, it's so great to have you here today, Mr. Song. I mean, we are recording at the Plaza Premium Lounge at Kiala A2. I know when you first started this business 20 years ago, this idea to have an airport lounge that is accessible to all travelers, regardless of class mm. or airline, must be something that was quite unthinkable back then. Tell us what made you take that plunge. <laughs> By the way, good morning. Thank you very much for coming in here. That's a very good question to start up with, actually, how, how I started this business. Uh, in fact, uh, my background was an investment banker because my seniority, obviously, I travel business class all the time. It's all paid by the bank. <laughs> but uh, after seven and a half years, I decided to start my own business. Obviously, I was travel economy classes because everything coming from my own pockets. You're talking about 27, 28 years ago when our laptops, okay, the battery only lasts for two hours, you have to recharge. And plus also, we don't have email, we only have fax, where you have to do word processing, print up and fax it up. But uh, when you don't have lounge, you cannot do it, this kind of work uh, in the airport. So I, I end up stealing electricity in the public alley. Can you imagine, I was used to be uh, a senior vice president for the company, Sunday, I had to steal electricity in the public alley. It's very, very embarrassing. Uh, so through embarrassment, I feel that, hey, airport is not humane enough. Why lounges where I used to enjoy it, only good for uh, what you call a CIP, commercial important person, i.e. first class business class person. Why economy class people do not have that kind of facility? You just imagine one full flight, 10 or 15% make up first and business class, 85% make up economy class. Why is 85% of people nobody taking care? I need only a few percentage out of 85%, like me, require these kind of services, then econometric will work. That's the reason I started this business. I thought I want to do something for public, for everybody. And I want to make sure that traveling it become more enjoyable, more convenient. When you first started that business, I think it was 1998, right? Uh, it was the time of the Asian financial crisis, 97, 98. Weren't you discouraged by the slowdown in the economy back then? In fact, that question was posed to be even at that time with my, all my friends. They say, hey, you crazy guy, you, you, you're holding such a senior post and the economy was not very good and you walk out for such a lucrative sort of a position and start your own business. And at the time, like you say, uh, begin a financial crisis. But my thinking is that, look, this kind of thinking that I have actually started from four or five years before 1998. But the opportunity came because uh, Kuala Lumpur International Airport and Hong Kong International Airport just started in 1998 and I managed to convince them to give me opportunity. Do you so, think a lot of knocking on doors? Exactly. I make a lot of presentation, try to present oh. to them this idea, but it's not easy. But uh, they, they managed to, manage to, I, I managed to convince them okay, to buy in this idea. And plus also, thinking about this economic crisis, I thought, we should take the opportunity because when the economic crisis came, came in, a lot of businessmen were not allowed to travel business class. A lot would travel to economy class. Then it would create a bigger market for me. That's how I thought during that time. Now, of course, uh, in recent years, uh, since <coughs> you started in 1998, Plaza Premium has moved uh, not just managing lounges and operating co-managing as well. You are into the airport transit hotel business. You are in meet and greet services, airport dining. How do you even decide which verticals do you go into? What kind of metrics do you look at? In fact, we started the uh, lounge business, and from there we managed airline lounges. Then from there we moved to meet and greet services, and moved into hotel businesses. Actually, all those movements, it's just only one thing, because we observe, we listen to what the client wants, and we, we explore opportunities. 
like for example hotel businesses when we operating lounges we see people lying on the floor sitting on the floor we ask them hey why are you lying on the floors uh, in the public alley they say hey look i don't want to pay 24 hours hotel room because it's too expensive i only require a few hours so it gave me the sort of idea hey why don't we operate hotel we just give them a comfortable sort of room and they require only a few hours. Why you have to charge them 24 hours like at the conventional hotel? That's how I started this airport called Aerotel. So Aerotel, the name comes from Aero Hotel combined to one word, you know, common law. They need you to develop your own name, you know, to register worldwide. That's how I started. So in short, basically what we do is to find an efficiency gap in the business travel journey. Then we fill it up. Now, I've read somewhere in the past uh, one of your media interviews, you've been described as somebody who listens a lot and has a penchant for observing. It makes me wonder, do you actually sit around airports just to look at uh, travelers' behaviors? <laughs> how, do you, how do you take notice of this inefficiency gaps that you have mentioned just now? I think this is a lot to do with my backgrounds because uh, I came from a village, Melaka, and we came, I came from a big family. We don't have luxuries like the kids present the, 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 in this modern world where the parents give them everything they want. For example, even toys, we have to find our own toys, we have to search and create our own toys to play. And food, we have to search for our food. And uh, this is how it practice. I, I train to be that way. Become, I, then I become very observant, very creative in a way ever since I was kids. So when I grew up, when I was in, the, in this business, I observed and listened to people and I, I, I went down to the floor and talked to my, my, my customer and see what they want and what do they require. That's how I found this business. So in short, what I'm trying to say is that there are two things that I like to convey to younger generations that first, when you have any crisis, don't walk away. There's a lot of opportunity. Like for example, I face crisis, I face unpleasant sort of a journey in the, in the traveling industry. Uh, while, while we're traveling, then I create a business out of it. And also you have to be observant and look deep into it and understand what your, what your passenger want, what your customer want, then create something new for them. Well, speaking of creating something new, in your observation, do you, what other gaps do you notice in the airport hospitality business that you think that hey, it's something that I might get into? <laughs> in fact, uh, in that, you, you realize that traveling industry becomes bigger and bigger. And uh, look at KL, uh, Kuala Lumpur. We have started with Subang, now with Subang KLA one and KLA 2 they are, Look at the passenger, it's growing. And it means the market is growing very, very wide. And plus also, people are more uh, digitalized. They know what's happening in the world. And no, they are more discerning. They want a quality of service. So we have to observe and try to provide something for them. And especially now in the airport, airport is a destination. And it's a lifestyle traveling. It's, it used to be the airport is just like what we call uh, transport infrastructure from one point to another. You are very happy. Now it's no more. People want during the journey. People want a quality of service. People. It's a lifestyle. Like I said, it's very important to find something to meet their requirement. So there's a lot of opportunity in the airport. Uh, I can give you more opportunity. Like for example, but any particular areas that you are looking at could be of interest to Plaza Premier? Oh, plenty, plenty of opportunity. I, I've been telling my children even, I say, hey, look, you wait until you, you, this business can, can continue for another for a few generations. Still a lot of opportunity coming up. For example, uh, yes, in the airport, we talk about digitalize, digitalization. Uh, when you talk about digitalization, you're talking about only process. I can envisage in the next five years, when you go pass through the, uh, the, the airport, you don't have the immigration counter, you don't have even security counter, because uh, facial recognition plus the scanning can know exactly what you're carrying. You just walk seamless, walk through the airport. But that is a process. But can you imagine that being a passenger, you want to be served by robots? You don't want, you like to be served by people. So you have plenty of time in the airport. 
So you have to provide more services for them because they want a quality of service, especially when people become more wealthy, they like to be served. So there's a lot of services. But in order to serve them, you've got to zoom into a targeted client. So you have to sort of analyze who is passing through in the airport. So you mean you have to understand the profile of your passengers. Okay, nowadays, look at the, the, the family, people travel with family too. If I'm, the, if I'm the businessman, travel by myself, and I travel with the family, the, total, the requirement is totally different. So you have to understand the profile of your, your passengers and also what is their requirement. Well, so Plaza important. Premium, you cater to, uh, I would say, two different markets, right? You have the Plaza Premium, and then you also have the Plaza Premium First exactly. to cater to the more elite market. So looking and being cognizant of the fact that traveling will be quite different in future, mm -hmm. are you looking at coming up with more segments to yes, cater definitely. to this? This one thing I observe, no airport in the world present when no airport in the world I emphasize taking care of millenniums. Hmm. Actually millennium is our future's customer. I've been sharing this idea with few airport including Kuala Lumpur International Airport where we must have the services taking care of Millennium. For example, what are the services Millennium want? Yes, Millennium may not, can, cannot afford the lounge, but you can create a lounge combined with co-working place, where a lot of digitalization, where there are a lot of interactive digitalization for them, and also the place for them to, to congregate, congregate together and we can exchange opinion. And also with all the food, you have to be modern and you have to create a lot of fusion food for them rather than expect them to eat what is normal food in the airport. You look at the airport, everywhere is the same food. You find McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Burger King, everywhere in the airport. So you have to create something new for them. Well, if you look at some of the trends we're seeing, cheaper air travel, rising middle class population, mm -hmm. especially look at uh, China, India, it seems to be like it the trends are voting really well for a company like yours, right? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you know where airlines are seeing headaches, you are actually seeing profits. So, so tell us, what are the challenges? I mean, looking ahead, you know, disruption in the industry. When you talk about word disruptions, I actually, a lot of magazines also branded me as a disruptor in the travel industry. Like for example, I disrupt lounge services, lounge traditionally, only good for the first and business class people. Now I open the lounge to everybody, regardless of the class and also airline traveling. And also I open a hotel, which normally will sell you 24 hours, we sell you only in the block basis, like six hours per block. So I disrupt the way they, 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 they operate in the, in the conventional way. And also I do meet and greet services in the airport, where meet and greet services are supposed to be for a VIP, but I can open to anybody. So. I basically disrupted in the travel industry. I enjoy it because uh, I create something for people to provide convenient, comfort, value, and love and care for, for all my all my my customers. Picking up your point about in future catering to millennials, you're saying co-working space is a possibility. Is that something that you're already actively looking into? Actually, if we are creating it present moment. I think the first one is this concept. We will put one first one in China in Shanghai. And I think give us, us an two or three months, you can see these things coming in. So you must catch the trend of the, of, of the passengers. It's very important. Now, speaking of Chang Shanghai, uh, China, rather very mm. interesting, high growth markets, rising middle income population, very digitally savvy uh, pop, uh, 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 people, travelers. What are the challenges though? Because I'm thinking that China is such a competitive market. You know, everybody wants to go into China. What are the insights that you can share with perhaps other businesses that you know taking a crack at China? What do you need to have? I have been with this business for 21 years, to be exact. Uh, seriously, always I try my heart, very, very hard to enter China because China is the biggest population. And also you heard a lot of China opening a big Shumangas of okay, the airport in the world. And the reasons I still unable until only one or two years ago to try to penetrate them because the structure in China where they're operating their own and they were not open to publics. But obviously after so many years, okay, after one at least one decade, they start opening up because the, the travel is more discerning and they want something much more convenient services, much more uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, comfortable services. Now they start knocking at my door, ask me to help them to create this kind of services. So you will soon see that we will be in Shanghai, we'll be in Beijing, we're going to open air hotel, one of our biggest okay, air hotel in our, our network. We have 230 rooms in Taxing International Airport, which is going to open the end of September. And we're going to Qingdao, and we're going, we are already in Guangzhou. We're slowly moving into it as well. So this is similar to strategies taken by airlines. They're moving uh, deeper into second tier cities. Is that the direction that you're looking for? Yes. Uh, like I said, because the structure is very, very tough, because uh, you must look at China as a big, so make up of many, many big countries. It's a continent, really. Exactly. <laughs> so it's not easy because each individual provinces, they operate their own airport. It's not national airport. So it's very hard to convince each individual province. But the things that you have to go to major airport first, the primary city, then when the primary city will set the example for secondary city to follow, and this is how China works. So uh, we are very, very confident that we will go into deeper in China. In fact, I allocate 100 million to US dollars to invest in three major countries. Now that is our strategy in the next three or four years. So that would be China, India? China, India, oh, you're right, and the state. US. These are three places. You recently uh, made some breakthrough into the US, and yes. I think, I believe it was Denver and... We are in Denver, we Fort are Worth. in Fort Worth. Okay. And uh, we, we're going to be in New York and also with LAX. Now, US is quite interesting because the introduction of independent airport lounges it's still relatively <laughs> new compared to I think Asia. And it, how do you see the market there progressing? It's true because uh, if you look at if you if you travel in the United States, you look at the infrastructure, especially in the airport, they are still uh, it's still very old. And uh, like you said, uh, independent lounge is totally a new concept to them because in the service industry, there's still a lot to catch up with Asia. And uh, we are moving in, and obviously, uh, you know, their population is huge. And do, who do not want to have a good service in the airport? So we basically move in, try to take advantage, and uh, we are the sort of first to enter into the market to introduce this independent lounge. What about competitors, the airlines? Are they your competitor? Ah, a lot of, a lot of people ask me this question. Actually, it's a myth, okay, uh, that question. Is, in fact, Airlines are not our competitors. Actually, we work as a complement to airlines. Airlines love us. Very simple. Airline is a transport in the in the transportation transportation business. They don't want to run the lounge. They don't want to operate lounge. It's not their forte to operate lounge. But now they found somebody can do it for them. Can take care of their what we call CIP customer. They love us, and we work as a complement to them. And they are a good partner actually. So they are in the transportation business, we help them to run. In fact, we, we, you saw that we also operate SkyTeam Lounge, we operate Star Lines Lounge, because a lot of lines, they group together. We help them to build the lounge, we invest in it. And so that uh, they don't have to sort out invest. And you know, airline is working on very, very cost-conscious operations. So we are there to help them when we combine and we have the network and also economic skill to operate for them. And then my question would be, how do you ensure that your own brand, Plaza Premium, remains at the top of customers' mind oh. compared to uh, these core brands that you're managing with other airlines? Okay, uh, let me just sort of uh, uh, tell you that I'm very proud to tell you that uh, Plaza Premium Lounge, we already won four times consecutively, four years, as the best independent lounge in the world. By Skytrax. By Skytrax. And it doesn't come easy. It's come from the, the team of people, work very closely together, understand our vision, and create this. It's not me alone can do it. So here I would like to thank my team of people. They are my greatest assets in the business. Uh, in order to get your brand up in the, in the market, it's very important in the service industry, nothing can make you move up to the top other than provide a consistent quality of service right at the first time and right at all times. A lot of service, a lot of service industry can be right at one time, mm. but it cannot be right at all time. But in order to be right at all time, first thing in the service industry, 
I think I, I, I think I personally I think it's very important to create a culture in the, in the company. You must have service culture. Mm -hmm. Like country have their own kind of different races that have their own cultures. In their own house, they have their own cultures. But in the corporation, you must have own culture as well. You, you have to nurture the culture. It doesn't come alone. What would you say is Plaza Premier's culture? Oh, we, we, we take pride of what we are doing. And anything we do, have to do the best. Otherwise, we do not do it. OK, everybody know it in here. Now, well, I want to touch a bit on customer experience because you know, when I told some people that I'll be interviewing you, ah. one of the questions is asked me is that uh, there is seems to be a problem in overcrowding in some of these uh, lounges, not just yours, because yes. with accessibility, uh, more people get to go in, but it's good for demand. I mean, strong demand is good for business, but at the same time, how does it affect customer experience? Because when people go to lounges, they want a quiet place to relax, they want Wi-Fi, they don't want overcrowding. So for Plaza Premium, has that been a, something that you are cognizant of to the fact? In fact, uh, you are right. I'm sure you observe some of our, op uh, our key city, the lounges in the key city airport. We have these kind of problems. The reason is that because airport cannot give me more space. So if airport cannot give you more space to expand your, your facility, what you have to do is internally you have to do something about it. Like for example, in terms of designs of the lounge, you have to very careful think about it because the flow of the customer in the lounge is so important. So when you, you go to my lounge, you can observe we create in such a way that if you want to eat, you have certain area and the rest you have certain area. Yet we still face these kind of problems. And uh, then what we do is to have a crowd control. So basically when the, the lounge reach about 75 to 80 percent, we stop from people coming in. So you mean in. tightening excess? Exactly. You have no choice. I would love them for I love for them to come in because I will make money, but quality of service is very important. So we have crowd control. That's why you got to excuse us if in case you had to queue up outside our lounge because of the crowd. What are the metrics that you look at before deciding that to open a lounge at this particular airport? I think it's very important to see the traffic of the airport. Uh, we have a rule of thumbs for us to be in the airport. At least we're looking for 10 million passengers. But certainly in Malaysia is totally different. It's my country. I will go to places even less than 10 million because I think this is my national service to help okay, Malaysia as well. Even though I know some of the places where I'm losing money, I still will go in to help as well. Because I'm a Malaysian, I will help Malaysia. Well, let's talk a bit about the future plan for Plaza Premium. I understand you had opportunities, offers previously to sell your business, mm -hmm. but you said no. Why? <laughs> yes, uh, you know, Everybody has that kind of ego. When you create a business out from nothing, out from my own bad experience, when you certain, reach a certain level, you want to test the market, see how valuable it is, other than keep on operating, keep on expanding. And certainly they are private equity company come and knock at my door and offer a huge amount of money. Then I decided not to sell because uh, I remember when I was studying in, in England, I study one subject called uh, Maslow theory, where people have a hierarchy of needs, the basic needs, self-recognition, and self-actualization. I think, I don't think money is my concern anymore. Don't get me, I'm, I'm not super rich, I'm just an ordinary uh, Malaysian citizen, but I think I enjoy what I'm doing, especially my services are okay, being enjoyed by travelers and create a lot of convenience and comfort for them. It gives me a lot of pleasure. Uh, that's the reason I decided not to sell. Plus another reason is that all my senior people I gather, I ask them would they want to sell my company and none of them say yes to me. <laughs> they enjoy what they are doing. What about possibility of listing the company? Uh, present moments, uh, look at our market. We are in, we are in 100 and 60 over outlet in 45 international airport. In the world, have over 1,000 international airport. If you do mathematical calculations, we are less than 5% of the markets. I mean, there's a wide area, it's huge for us. Why should we list it up now, price moments? And we are not looking for money. And uh, financially, to be frank, we are very, very strong. 
and uh, we, we, we do not sell just for the sake of selling. I think a lot of uh, heart and mind in, in the business and a lot of, uh, a lot of what we call uh, uh, teamwork that they want to expand it further. Uh, in fact, I describe my business in the tips of the iceberg. So it's still a lot of room to improve. So a lot of room to growth, but what do you see uh, are some of the challenges in the coming years for Plaza Africa? Oh, in, in this business, I say, in all the service industry, not only in Malaysia, I think across the board, especially in Asia, uh, the biggest challenge is to find a talented people. And people share the vision to, together with you to develop this business. Like you all know that now the younger generation don't like to be served. They, they don't like to serve people, they like to be served. So it's very hard to find people with this kind of mindset. Uh, in Malaysia, we're still very lucky. Uh, in Malaysia, what we do, I know people, younger generation in Kuala Lumpur don't like to do serve industry. What we do is go to outside Kuala Lumpur. We go to Tengano, Kelantan, Sabah, Sarawak. We bring them back in Malaysia. We house them, provide a good accommodation. We provide them astro. We provide them aircon, we give them digital sort of internet, make sure they're safe, and we give them our training. So you actively reach out to exactly. graduates? Or... Exactly. Okay. And we have interns, the uh, management internship programs, and we also so we have what we call a, a management training program as well. So we try to encourage younger generation to come in the service industry. Remember I say, look at the service industry, it's still a lot of white area, a lot of room. So not handing over the reins anytime soon? Mm. Not present moment, plus also because I have two children. My, my, I'm very lucky in the way my two children enjoy what they are doing. And now my two children is helping me. One of them is taking care of branding, the other one is going doing the business developments. So they enjoy what they are doing. Although I know uh, they hardly have time for themselves and the most important I see that they are enjoying. So I'm happy with it. <laughs> Just one final question for me. You are originally from Malacca, Sungai Udang to be exact. Now if someone were to ask you, um, how do I become that boy from Sungai Udang and that is now running one of the most successful airport businesses in the world? What do you say to them? By the way, I don't, th I, I, I don't think you know where is Sungai Udang. I have no idea where is Sungai Udang. I know it's near the sea, that's all I know. Actually, I came from a small village. I'm a village boy. Uh, I, I, this is my own personal experience. I think uh, poor is not, uh, it's not the bad thing in life because our family is, I would not say we're poor. We came from a very big family in the village and my father is, was a Sunday shopkeeper. And you know how much we can to take care of 13 of us. So even food on the table, we had to fight for the food to eat. And I used to wear my brother's pants and shoes. Uh, in a way, it trained us to be a survivor. Train us to, train us to be alert and be more observant what is happening. So being a poor is not the bad thing. It make you want to have a fighting spirit. You want to be successful, and then uh, you you will look up for opportunity. Nowadays, the kids are given on silver platter. They, they don't want, they don't need to fight, they don't need to think our box. So we all have to think our box. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, as long as you're willing to try, you're willing to, hard, uh, to work hard, okay, in, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this society. Because as a whole society getting wealthier, and people like to be served. And when people like to be served, you, you, as long as you have a good personality, okay, not, Okay, academic knowledge is, is not so important. You don't have to be a PhD or MBA to be in the service industry, or even you don't have to, to have a first degree to be in the service industry, but you must have a good personality, and you must know how to love people. When you see people, you're not even prepared to shake hands with people. Come on, please don't go into the service industry. So you must know how to smile with people, it's very important. Like I always tell people, I say, look, God has given you the best thing. You know what is that? Your smile. And that is the greatest asset that God has given you. And Please I'm use smiling it. Smiling widely. Because <laughs> I'm so appreciative for this. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I assume this has been a great interview. And I wish you all the best with Plaza Premium. Thank you very much. Thank nice you so much. Thank you.